The discovery of X-ray radiation in 1895 by Röntgen is considered as one of the biggest scientific breakthroughs of the 19th century. Soon after its discovery, its potential applications in medical imaging and crystallography were realized. Since then, over 20 Nobel Prizes across the fields of physics and chemistry were awarded for work related to X-rays. One of the remarkable applications of X-rays was using them to help determine the structure of DNA, discovered by Crick and Watson, who were awarded a Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine in the early 1960s. For many decades, one of the main limitations towards investigating structures on a submolecular level was the lack of intense and coherent radiation sources. With recent technological advances, however, we are now able to have free electron lasers capable of producing X-ray beams of unprecedented brightness and coherence. These advances ushered X-ray science into a new era. Additionally, the current free electron lasers are able to produce ultra-short pulses within the femtosecond range, which are used for real-time tracking of reaction kinetics. But future improvements are predicted to reach the level of capturing even so-called electronic movies. Free electron lasers, ultra-bright future of science. X-rays are electromagnetic radiation of energies of about 1 kilo electron volt, which corresponds to wavelengths of the size of about 1 angstrom. These wavelengths are of comparable size to the intramolecular and atomic dimensions, and therefore can be used for probing the electronic structure of molecules with atomic resolution. Since their discovery in November of 1895 by Röntgen, X-rays attracted immense attention. Due to their good penetration properties, immediate applications in medical imaging were found. Röntgen, who was a big enthusiast of photography, just one month after the discovery decided to make use of the new toy and took a picture of his wife's hand. The ability to see the interior of the human body without surgery was a huge achievement and the news of X-rays quickly spread around the world. The first great scientific breakthrough with X-rays came in 1912 when von Lau and his colleagues reported on the observation of a diffraction pattern from crystals. X-rays not only allowed an insight into the human body, they also allowed us to see the structure of crystals on the molecular level. For many decades, the main limitation in observation of structures even smaller than crystalline ones, such as molecules and atoms, was availability of very intense X-ray sources. The first designs for X-ray sources were based on a discharge lamp, which were quickly improved and named Coolidge tubes. Electrons were emitted from the cathode onto the anode, resulting in the production of X-rays. The power output of these tubes, however, was rather low. The main improvements in the production of X-ray beams came first with synchrotrons. In synchrotrons, charged particles move in large rings. Periodically, these particles are subject to a radial acceleration due to bending magnets. The accelerated charged particles then emit electromagnetic radiation, which can be used for the experiments. Synchrotron radiation is characterized to have broad spectrum, high level of polarization, high intensity of produced radiation, and relatively high coherence of produced radiation. The radiation produced by synchrotrons can be also in the form of short pulses of the order of picoseconds. The main problem with synchrotrons was their inability to reach the limit of light coherence that was required for some experiments, such as an investigation of inelastic scattering of light from molecules. The solution came with the free electron lasers, whose capabilities surpassed the ones of synchrotrons. Both Synchrotrons and free electron lasers also solved another problem of many electromagnetic sources. They were tunable, and that was a big step forward compared to conventional lasers and masers developed at that time. The first free electron laser reaching the X-ray regime started lasing in 2009. It was located in Stamford in the US and is currently considered as one of the most powerful X-ray sources in the world, with a relative brightness of about 1 billion times greater than that of traditional synchrotron sources. Nowadays, there is a handful of X-ray free electron laser facilities scattered around the world. A few new ones are still under construction. Unlike in synchrotrons, in free electron lasers, electrons are linearly accelerated and periodically enter undulators, arrays of magnets with alternating poles. Costas will tell you more about the theory behind free electron lasers. 
So to give you a quick crash course into free electron lasers, uh, let's take a few minutes to talk about them. So free electron lasers, or commonly known as FELs, are fundamentally uh, made up of two simple systems, of an electron and an electromagnetic wave. And our end goal here is to have an interaction that transfers energy from the electron into electromagnetic wave, basically amplifying it. And to consider this interaction, we can consider a simple electrostatic interaction given by the formula here. And with this force, we have that the work done on the electron is given by the equation here. So basically, it's just a dot product between the force of the electric field and the velocity of the electron. And this just gives us uh, the dot product between the electric field and the velocity of the electron. So this is all nice and good, and we have an interaction that we sought for. However, uh, there's a bit of a problem if we consider uh, an electron moving in the same direction as the electromagnetic wave, as seen by this picture here. So if we have both of these two systems moving in the same direction, uh, the problem arises uh, because of the fact that the electric field in the EM wave is transverse, uh, which basically means that the trajectory of the electron and the direction of the electric field are perpendicular to each other. So by this equation here, a dot product will give us zero. So there's zero interaction between these two, which is a big problem for us because we can't have any energy transfer in that case. So how do we remedy this? So to fix our little problem, uh, we can make our electrons wiggle with the help of magnets. And this can be done by using a handy instrument called the undulator. And in essence, what it is, is just two collection of magnets that have alternating poles as shown in this picture here. Because of the Lorentz force produced by these magnets, we have that our electron follows a sinusoidal pattern as shown in this picture here. So because of this sinusoidal pattern, we finally have that our electric field and our electron can finally couple. However, there still is another small problem that we must solve. So in essence, the problem that we have is that the electrons and the EM's waves, wavelengths, and more importantly, velocities are slightly different. Uh, and this basically means that the EM wave will shift um, a bit with respect to the motion of the electron. And this is quite bad for us because that means that the phase of the electron and the AM wave is different, which basically means that the interaction will alternate between absorption and emission, in the end giving zero gain. To ensure that the phase is constant, uh, we, can, uh, we can choose some parameters which will ensure that in the half a period of electrons uh, motion, the EM waves uh, wavelength shifts half a wavelength as shown here. So we can see that in this picture, the electric field and the velocity, uh, the sign between these two is constant throughout the electron's motion. And this condition can be fixed uh, for a specific wavelength of light by alternating two parameters. Uh, first one is the velocity of the electron, and the second one is the period of the undulator. And both of these are technical parameters. So for a specific wavelength of light, uh, both of these parameters can be easily switched and changed. So this is basically what results in the high tunability of uh, FEL. Now that we have ensured that the energy is sustainably transferred for a single electron, uh, we must look to more general case, uh, since in, from an accelerator we have a bunch of electrons. Uh, the width of the bunch is usually a lot larger than the wavelength of light. And what happens then is that the electrons have different phases, and thus they emit radiation incoherently. That is a big problem for us. Uh, actually, though, this is not actually a big problem, because in the FEL, this problem self-corrects. And what I mean by that is that electrons that, are, uh, that emit radiation actually um, 
lose some energy and thus they start moving slower, while electrons that uh, absorb radiation actually uh, get some energy and they start moving faster. So because of this velocity modulation, in the end what we have is this micro bunching, uh, micro bunch structure developing in the uh, electron bunch. Because of this, the, these bunches in essence behave as a single electron and we have coherent radiation. So just to summarize, the overall structure of the FEL is shown here. So what we have is we have an accelerator from which we get an electron bunch. And this bunch uh, gets passed to an undulator, which makes this bunch wiggle. And this wiggle ensures that the electrons couple to the AM radiation. And as it moves to the undulator, the electron bunch develops a micro bunch structure, which ensures that the bunches uh, emit radiation coherently. In the end, we obtain uh, radiation that is more coherent and a lot more intense than what you would expect from a synchrotron. And this has a number of possible applications in scattering experiments and in spectroscopy applications. In order to find out more, we ask leading scientists to explain how to use FELs in their research. Okay, so here at the university I work over in the Centre for Science at Extreme Conditions and all of us there are interested in how do materials behave at very high or low temperatures and very high pressures and that's the area I work in. How do simple materials change, how do their physical properties change when we put them up to half a million, a million, ten million times atmospheric pressure. So if we wanted to compress, let's compress something simple like a piece of copper. So we would get a thin copper foil, maybe a few millimetres square, maybe 20 microns thick, and you stick a piece of plastic on the surface of that, and then you hit the plastic with a very high-powered laser pulse, which may only last a few nanoseconds. Mm. The plastic is instantly heated up to a plasma and blows off explosively in that direction, and Newton's laws says you generate equal and opposite forces in the other direction, and you generate a shock wave which comes from the plastic into the copper, and that shock wave is travelling at kilometres a second. You're much, much faster than the speed of sound in air, and for a few nanoseconds you can generate truly enormous pressures in temperatures in the copper foil before the shock wave reaches the back of the copper and everything blows up. So we need to do our experiment in that two or three nanoseconds between the shock wave going into the material and it blowing the material apart at the other side. So uh, if we wanted to look at the material in a, a diamond anvil cell, what we do is we take these to big synchrotrons, big circular X-ray machines. There's one in Oxfordshire. We were at the one in Hamburg in Germany last week. And we bring the x-ray beam into the sample, very small beam, and scatter out the other side. Now, they are incredibly intense machines, but the pulses, the x-rays in each pulse, are not strong enough, not intense enough, to give us good x-ray data from these compressed samples that we do with a laser. So x fells are a billion times brighter than a synchrotron. So people say, well, it's only worth doing if you get an extra factor of 10. An x fell gives us a factor of a billion in brightness over any synchrotron. And so what we do, as I said, we bring the laser in, compress the material, and just before the shock wave gets through the material, we time it so a single pulse from the x fell comes in. These pulses from the x fell are only 100 femtoseconds long, which is forever compared to a nanosecond. And if we get the timing just right, we can look at the sample at its peak compression just before it blows itself apart a couple of nanoseconds later. And there, these are, this, your sample is always destroyed in these experiments. The combination of the laser to generate the shock wave and the X-ray pulse itself completely vaporizes your sample. But it's okay, we just bring the next sample in and do it all again.
And so our, our first uh, really kind of big experiment was uh, one which, which you could call kind of a molecular movie. So this is essentially following the structural, the structural dynamics of the molecule. And so, of course, uh, these are still early days, so someone has to look at simple systems. In this case, it was a molecule called cyclohexadiene, which is essentially a six-membered uh, carbon ring. And it, this has been sort of a model system for, for the chemistry for a long time. So when you, when you photoexcite this molecule, uh, what happens is that the molecule uh, breaks uh, one of the carbon-carbon bonds and it becomes uh, just, just a linear uh, chain of six uh, carbons. And interesting, this reaction is extremely quick. So, so it happens in, in less than 200 femtoseconds. And uh, we were able to, to reproduce uh, a rather detailed, uh, um, if you wish, a movie, uh, a mapping of the motions of, of the heavy atoms in the molecules, not the carb uh, not the hydrogen, sorry, but, but, the, but the carbons, uh, from, from the moment when, when the molecule is photoexcited till, till the very end. And so this, is a, this kind of molecular movie is, is interesting because it, it complements what we can learn from spectroscopy. So spectroscopy will, will probe uh, the energy levels in the molecule, essentially the, the, what the electrons are doing. But um, it does not as much probe um, the, the structural geometrical changes in the molecule. And so basically only by having both aspects you can really unravel uh, chemical reactions and see how they, how they unfold. So for me, it's always the, the latest experiment, which is the most uh, interesting one, uh, it, to some degree, because the problem that you don't quite yet understand is always more exciting than the one you sort of solved. But um, at, at the moment, what we're really fascinated about is trying to uh, not just detect the structural dynamics of a molecule, but actually understand better the redistribution of electron density in the molecule during a chemical process. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is still very much at, at, what, at the limit of what one can possibly achieve uh, with ultra-fast scattering experiments. And so uh, one, actually one of the problems, one of the fundamental issues here is that um, it's difficult to disentangle the contribution to the scattering signal from changes in the positions of the, of the atoms uh, from the just redistribution of electron density in the molecule. So both will give a change in the scattering and, and, and both contributions are convoluted and there's no uh, straightforward way to, to disentangle them. Now what, we, what we're hoping to, to see very soon is a, a sort of simplified case of, of an excited state in the, in the molecule where the electron density changes but uh, the, exci uh, the excitation of the molecule is not associated with uh, distinct uh, nuclear motion. And in, in such a special case, one might be able to just, as a proof of principle, show that uh, we can observe electronic states, excited electronic states. Yeah, so, so I think one of the exciting, if you ask several theoreticians this question, you'll get several different answers. But, but personally, uh, I'm intri intrigued by the fact that we're still not fully exploiting the fact that that the X-ray radiation to come out of an X-flow is in fact uh, coherent. It's, it's, it's a laser, it's X-ray laser, rather than just an incoherent source of X-ray photons. Um, this uh, has consequences for what one can actually detect in an experiment. And uh, I, I think my prediction is that over the next uh, five to 10 years, we will see uh, well, we're already seeing early signs of theoretical ideas that are inspired by this, this property, the coherence property of the light. But I think over the next few years, we'll see uh, more and more elaborate experimental attempts to actually detect these signals. And, and they, these could again be a very interesting route towards uh, going far beyond just uh, the structural deformations of, of matter to detect more intricate quantum mechanical um, uh, effects that are still extremely important to photochemical, photophysical processes, but which normally would require, say, multidimensional spectroscopies, optical spectroscopies to be detected. Uh, and, and I think that we will see experiments using X-fells that can, can see these things too.